The dictionary definition of respect is to consider someone worthy of high regard or esteem. The scripture tells us that God is no respecter of persons. So how do we look at all of his children as worthy, even with those who we may differ from? Hi, and welcome to Magnify, an LDS living podcast where we cheer, inspire, and embolden each other as women and followers of Jesus Christ. We hope to use our influence to make a difference in the world. I'm your host, Katherine Davis, a mom, a seminary teacher, and a grilling enthusiast who loves God. In his talk, Peacemakers Needed, President Nelson said, we can literally change the world, one person and one interaction at a time, by modeling how to manage honest differences of opinion with mutual respect and dignified dialogue. Did you hear that? We can literally change the world when we treat each other with respect, despite our many differences or worldviews, it creates a ripple effect of peace to talk more about changing the world. Like our prophet asked of us, I am with a previous guest and my dear friend, Emily Snyder. Well, Emily, I am so excited that you are here today and that we can have such a good discussion. I am psyched too. I loved that. Our first chat was like, wait, can we be friends? And now here's an attempt again. I know. I just felt like this connection and that you were just such this amazing person that I needed in my life. And then. Well, you're, I happened? mean, that says more about how poor your, your discernment is. Whatever. <laughs> well, since you've been a guest before, we are going to forego the rapid fire questions. And I'm just going to ask you something else. Fantastic. I just want to know if you could tell us three things that you are finding joy in or that are bringing happiness into your life right now. Oh my gosh. So good. And can I just say, usually I feel like I ask random people these types of questions all the time. And since they always throw people off, I rarely answer them. And so I thank you for giving me a dose of my own medicine. So I'm like, okay, (laughs) yesterday I actually said this to my mom. So I, I'm moving, I've been in a renovation process for a condo that I bought in downtown Salt Lake in a hundred year old apartment building. Um, It used to be a high end hotel back in the day. And it's just had this multiple levels of iteration of individuals that live in the building. And so it's everything that's in this building and it gives me such joy and it's finally finished. So we were moving in a bunch of my belongings yesterday, exhausted as we were driving away from it, since I'm not ready to sleep in that yet. And I just told my mom, I am just giddy and thrilled about creating that space. Like I couldn't be more excited to actually be at the spot to like make it my own, recreate dreams, edit past dreams, make new ones and just find this spot. So that's number one. Number two was Vessel is a restaurant in Utah that is a fast food. It's like healthy dining. There are very limited foods I can eat because I have some really intense anti-inflammatory reactions to a lot of foods. And we went to Vessel and I was like, I'm so excited (laughs) going to Vessel (laughs) because there isn't a Vessel near where I live with my parents right now. And so it's like such a delight. And then three, I am going, I, I've decided to give myself vacations week long vacations by myself because I'm a family of one. And typically you plan family vacations or spouse vacations. And since those aren't in my world, I have now extended family vacations that I will definitely prioritize, but I am the last number of years I've really identified and recognized if I'm going to have a family vacation for my Emily Snyder family, that means a solo trip, which I love solo trips. So I'm taking myself on a week long vacation Again, I did one in February. I did one last August. So I'm so excited. Where are you going? This time to save money because of that apartment renovation. I'm yeah. going to my parents' home. They have a Zen house down in Southern Utah. And I'm going to write. That's the whole point is to just write and get thoughts and heart experiences out and just see what I can create one day. So I'm so excited. I'll eat yummy food and go to Sprouts and stock up on healthy treats. I mean, I'm so excited. (laughs) Okay. So your apartment, food and a vacation. Yeah. I mean, 
wait a second. There's nothing better. <laughs> like there, <laughs> there's food in there. So there is food. There is. that's so good. Well, Emily, you know that as a Magnify community, we've been working on becoming better at being peacemakers and diving into what that really means. And President Nelson, in his landmark address, mentioned something that I think could have been really easily overlooked by many of us. And I want to dig into that a little bit with you. He says that part of being a peacemaker is respect and learning how to respect others, ourselves, and God. I want to talk with you a little bit about respect today, but before we do, when I say that word, what is the first song that comes into your mind? R-E-S-P-T-T. Find yeah. out what it means to me. We kind of have to yeah. just get that out of our head, get right? It yeah, yeah, <laughs> get it out. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think respect for someone looks like, or what does that mean? Oh, there's so many thoughts that I had in thinking through this topic and conversation for today. And the very first one I thought of was the difference between respect and authority. And like, what is the differentiation? Because oftentimes I think when I get bugged and forget to respect people, it's because I'm older or I'm paying for a service. And so treat me better. Or like, I've just had more experiences in a certain situation. And so, and those are elements I think of authority that the Yoda figure would have of like, he's got the wisdom, he's had the life experience, he's, he's found success in something. Or he has the title. He has the title. He's done all those things. And so maybe when I lose, when I'm acting in a way where I forget the respect piece is how I might see that authority figure interacting and it may not align to my value set perhaps, or when I look at myself and how I perhaps am not the most respectful in in patient moments, like maybe with a furniture company, customer service individual, when I'm frustrated and I'm like, I'm older, I'm paying what the heck you're just getting your paycheck. That's not respectful. (laughs) And so finding that space of like, wow, am I playing into an authority mindset that I get my way or like, what's my end goal in the conversation? I think those with authority assume respect is a given. I assume the furniture gal that I can demand respect because I'm the paying customer. When in reality, respect is always, always earned. Always in my life in general, I've just been thinking a lot about the scripture in first John four nineteen. We love him because he first, he first loved us as a school teacher. I remember classes I taught in the low income school and I had some of the sweetest, toughest battles with my students because they were in a life situation where their parents were capable or had the opportunity to be the parents sometimes. So my students as a sixth grader often had to be the authority figure in their home. They had to take care of themselves or their younger siblings. And so to come to then have a teacher fight them at times to be the adult in the room or to be the one, there was often this wrestle. And I remember one conversation in particular of a student making some sort of comment. And I'm sure it was in my younger teaching years where I was like, but I'm the teacher. So you have to respect me. And he's like, no, you have to earn my respect first and foremost. And you are the adult. So start right. I'm like, you're not wrong. Wise child. Well, as a teacher too, I think that's really fascinating, especially with that scripture. He first loved us. And then we are able to respect that and understand that. And so in order to earn respect, we have to first show respect, right? Yeah. Yeah. And to start the conversation and not just assume, like it takes a lot of proactiveness. So what have you learned about respect from your working life? Like, I know that you worked with Chip and Joanna Gaines, which is something that I'm sure our Magnify community would all love to know more about. But in their manifesto, in the Magnolia Manifesto, it reads, we believe in human kindness, knowing we are made better when we all work together. Yeah, so good. There, The manifesto 
for Magnolia is glorious. And another line in there is we believe in cartwheeling outside of our comfort zone. <gasps> oh, I love that. I know. It's such a fun visual. It talks about cartwheeling and this mindset of just a, a fun proactiveness that I think this in relationship to this human kindness and there's the respect part is it's a proactive effort to show human kindness. It's not an autopilot because there are many, many moments that we can easily not be kind. So when has someone shown you that human kindness or that respect that you were then able to emulate? Oh, yeah, my tissues. Another incredible individual that I got to work with was Clayton Christensen, um, who passed away in 2020. And I don't know that there will be a day that I don't talk about him without tears because he lived this in every possible way. He wrote a book called How Will I Measure My Life with two other co-authors. One of them, Clay Christensen, devoutly a member of our faith community and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And then a student, a former student of his who was strongly atheist. And then another woman who was in the middle. Like she, she did not not believe in God, but she didn't have a specific religion that she was dedicated to. And the whole book, the mindset takes all of his business theories, but then says, how do you measure success? And how do you measure your life? It's by the individual relationships that you have one-on-one every day. He lived that 100%. It didn't matter as the person that got to manage the calendar of one of the most thought out business thinkers in the world. He gave equal amount of time to the gentleman in his ward that was a handyman that needed a job as he did to the CEOs or political leaders that were knocking down a store. Like every single one, the answer was, they're all the same. They're all, they all get equal amount of time, energy and efforts. And he lived that. So me being the assistant there's definitely the authority world. Yeah. I, I was the assistant. I was the, for the rest of the world that I worked with, when I had my title on my email saying, I'm the assistant, their perception is I'm the, get the laundry. I'm the go get the lunches person. For Clay, I was the vice president of op- operations. I was everything. So when I made a statement, it was, it was it. And he He went and did what I organized for him to go do. And he literally handed his life to me and would say, great, whatever. And then consequently, I was invited. His rule was if there was any conversation that I was interested in, the door was always open. And that meant also not just in his business life, but his family also did the same thing in their home. And I got to be the participant at so many tables at home that I had no right to be in, but they opened the door over and over and over again to be a member of the family and to join them on vacations. And anyway, so the Christensen family 100% exemplified this and showcased and let me practice hopefully what was already a piece of me, but just help me magnify (laughs) as much as I possibly could. This mindset of human kindness, respect, no respecter of persons. Like, so how have you practiced that? I like how you said practice too. Thank you. Um, I didn't practice it very well with the furniture gal this morning, tragically. Dang it. I was so good for a while. And then I got transferred to somebody else after so many minutes. So I didn't practice that great after a half hour of trying to solve a furniture issue. By the fourth person, my respect (laughs) dropped. So what do you do in those moments? Like when we totally mess up, when we look back at something and say, oh, that wasn't so great. I wish I would have done that better. And even it reminds me of a story that a mutual friend just told us. She was in Salt Lake and leaving lunch and going back to her office. And she passed a homeless man and he was holding a sign up. And this sign said, ask me about my life. And the sign caught her attention, but it didn't stop her to ask him a question. And for weeks, she has thought about that moment. Like I didn't do it. I should have done it. What do we do in those moments when we're not so good at it? Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) I know. Like, so it just happened this morning. So now what? Right. Well, 
So a couple of thoughts. I remember one time my dad asked me what I want to do with my life. And I was just like, I just want to be kind to people. And he's like, yeah, that's not a job. <laughs> and I was like, but it, I've realized that there, there are life details that have to happen. So our friend may have had a meeting to get back to. And in a dream world, in a utopia land, like there would have been time she could have gotten back and said, I'm sorry, I had this moment. I'm 15, 20 minutes late because I had this really neat experience. In some worlds that might happen, be okay periodically. Most of our lives, that's an unacceptable. Like, no, we've got things to do. People are relying on us. There's work to be done. There's limited amounts of time and resources. And for me, that's where it came down to of like, I have this window of time that I have allocated to get all these pieces that I feel obligated to do, want to do whatever for my job, for my life, for my family. And you just took 30 of the 15 I have allotted for this moment. So like, what the heck? (laughs) This isn't a hard thing. So I think it's just giving to the question of respecting self also, I think is a huge piece of respecting. Yeah. So maybe I blew it in that moment, but maybe, but I'll be respectful to my child or to my mom or to my, whatever, my coworker in a different way, because being on time is respectful to the other people. So like, which relationships also need the trade-offs and, and how am I calibrating the trade-offs of the relationships? Probably that's where I want to land in my answer. Well, and I think I've never thought of being respectful will help me be a peacemaker and being respectful will ultimately bring more peace into my life. Mm-hmm. And if that's what I want more than anything. So you said something interesting. We have to have respect for self first. Why is that? I mean, in another conversation we had with another friend, I like humans. I would much, much rather interact with humans. Like if I can be okay with my humanness, then I think there's a lot of space to be okay with other humanness to recognize, I don't know what all is going on in that person's life. And so I can take all of the pieces and attempt to just be more gracious and more patient and to say, I see you. I don't know all the pieces, but if I know all the pieces that I'm juggling in my life, I'm going to guess you're juggling a similar amount of pieces in your life. And I don't know what that's looking like. I don't know what that's going like. That was one thing I really appreciated either Clay articulating for me or practicing with him of just the thing we always hear about. You never know. But the more I recognize I'm allowed to be human, I then feel like I give other people permission to be human. And I say that, like, that is the phrase that I say is, well, I like working with humans. So if it's too many, then it turns into a like, okay, well, because I respect you, this is an ongoing thing. I don't want you to keep living in such a way that this is damaging. It does begin with self for everyone. And so what are steps that we can honestly take to help us have more respect for ourselves? Because I I think a lot of us seek outside validation. If it's a good lesson, I think it's a good lesson because my students said it was a good lesson. Or if I'm a good mom, it's because my kids are happy. Or if like I'm seeking outside validation and that is not having respect for myself. Yes and no, because I mean, I think it also, I don't think that's a negative thing, but I think it's a reality of life. I mean, again, I think that's humanness. I don't, I mean, that's so fun that you're asking me these questions. Like, I don't (laughs) Well, it's, this is what I think, Emily. I was a perfect mom before I had kids. Yeah. (laughs) And then I had them and I thought, I am am a perfect mom because I don't have them. I recognize. Right. And I think some of that comes through experience. Some of that comes through failure and mistakes. Some of the respect for myself and especially like what you said, the respect for others comes because I do make mistakes. Well, I, I mean, I tongue in cheek made this, made a similar comment when I was teaching Sunday school one time of in the gospel doctrine of, I get it. I don't have kids. So I am the perfect parent. And I think a lot of people's confidence fails because they have now watched their children make choices that they thought they taught them differently. And so confidence is completely lost. 
And I, for being bold and adamant about certain things, I was like, well, hold up. Let's talk about what I'm bold and adamant about. I'm not saying that it's X, Y, Z, or that it looks a certain way, but I am bold and adamant in mindsets of a relationship, of redefining success, of saying, what am I actually trying to accomplish? And what is truly the end goal? Is the end goal a perfect house? I might invite people to rethink that. So I think it's that mindset that for me then gives me self-respect because I'm defining success between me and God. I mean, I've said it for a while and I will say it till I die that being single has been my greatest opportunity to wrestle out what success means for me and God because the pathway that I anticipated successful women of God to look like is not what's happened in my life. No matter how many dating books I have read to try to understand, no matter how many times I've fasted every week for that marriage thing, like I've done all the things and no matter what, like to wrestle out and realize God loves me for me and what my efforts are and how I work it out with him. That is success. Like I I have my new definition of success. Well, do you think that's what it means when it says God is no respecter of persons, Mm. right? Like what the world or our church culture determines as success is not what God will determine as success for me. That's, that's in my individual relationship with him, right? Like success is going to look different today than maybe it did last year. Mm-hmm. And success is going to look different next week uh, than it does today. I have to have that with him, right? I have to have that vertical relationship So that I am looking at what success means, that he's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care about position or influence. That's not what he's caring about. Yeah. And my therapist would angst that you said have to. I now angst because thank you. He's taught me so much to be like, there are no need to's or no have to's. Life is trickier when we don't focus on the Lord first and foremost. And that definition with him, I think it gets more complicated sometimes. But I love that idea of no respecter in that regard, because I also think about it in terms of, I've been given a lot of opportunities and I know that I've made opportunities out of the opportunities I've been given. I haven't sat around And I haven't just looked at a lot of grand opportunities and been like, well, I mean, I think of the parable of the talent of like, I've been given some and I've gone and done something with them. But I also recognize I was born in a situation that allowed a lot of opportunities and, and the home and the family that I have. I often feel like Emily Snyder, if you don't do something, shame on you because of the things that I feel like the Lord has handed me. And I know the Lord hands us all our own packages to have our own journeys. And I think that with the heavenly eyes of saying, I know, I know this one bites and I know you got a bum deal. And so if that didn't work out and you didn't do X, Y, Z, so it doesn't look like the Leah Hona cover of the magazine, totally fine. Because I know, I know what you're fighting. I know what you're dealing with. So that is not the expectation I have. And I think that's where, for me, no respecter of persons comes into play is that Clay would teach that God is not, God has such a perfect vision that in our mortal mind, we have to accumulate things. We have to put them all in categories. We have to put them all so we understand and we can compute, but he's not, he's the perfect accountant and he doesn't need categories. I'm a category of one. And so I'm not compared to anybody else. He doesn't have to measure anything else in comparison. That's what I love about that mindset of no respect to a person. I think sometimes we view it as a graph where some people may be respected more, or blessed more, and we see it as a graph, but God is looking over it all. Yeah. He doesn't see. <laughs> and they're all individuals. Right. He can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So if God is not a respecter of persons. What do you think he's asking us about who or what deserves our respect? Well, I want, I want to maybe think about that in context to the peace conversation. What is he asking in the respect conversation? Because I do think the greatest gift of having an intimate personal relationship with our father through Jesus Christ is peace that no matter what happens, 
there's confidence that we can navigate it, which then in that question. So then what is the ask is for me to say, okay, maybe so-and-so created a work situation that now makes my life 10 times more complicated, but I can navigate that. I've got Christ and I can navigate that. They don't have to show up the way I anticipated them showing up. They can show up the way they showed up. And that is what it is. And I don't need to, I don't need to stress about that because with Christ, I can navigate whatever pieces come along and we're all reasonable people. We all want similar things. So just because we're coming at it from different angles, we can handle that. And a lot of that depends. What you said earlier is having respect for God and for Jesus Christ and having respect to me also means trusting in his power and in his ability, right? I think of that story of Peter so much when Peter gets out of the boat and walks to the savior and everybody talks about him sinking and the the savior reaches down and pulls him up. But I just think about what got him out of the boat in the first place. Like how in the world did he take that first step and what experiences did he have with the savior that he knew it would be okay to step out? And my favorite part of it is probably a similar chain of that is he felt where else would I rather fall than in a spot where the savior is instantly, intimately scooping me up and saving me. If he stayed on the boat, he never would have had the embrace and that one-on-one moment of failing and then being saved by the savior that could only happen because he failed, failed, failed (laughs) because he fell and took the risk. He then had such a sacred moment with the savior that he would have missed out on if he hadn't gotten out of the boat. So Emily, what experiences have you had with the savior that gives you the faith that he will help you navigate? Okay. I'm just going to use a whole box of tissues today. Thanks, Catherine. (laughs) So many. Uh, And I think especially, like I said, the wrestling of being single, but then the byproduct of that is career choices. Like I was engaged a couple times, different stories for different days. But after one of them, a dear family friend said, the world is your oyster. You can do anything. And I was like, I don't want to do anything. Like, this is what I wanted. But after I picked up the pieces and gathered them all up and then gave them to God to make that Japanese pottery and fill it with gold. Like when I finally was able to breathe again, I was like, she's not wrong. I mean, that's one of the greatest blessings of my life is the world is my oyster. I can do whatever I want. Sometimes it feels like a headache that I I'm not bound by a lot of things. It's paralyzing in an opposite way because every part of the equation is a variable for the most part for me. So I could pick up and move and live in China. And I only have me as a party of one to support. So like, there's so many things that I could do. And so that wrestle has been beautiful realizing What is success for my life? What are the opportunities in a world where I had the vision before of what I was lacking was a spouse and children and a home and whatever. And now looking at saying, what trees did you give me? What are all the possible fruits? S. Michael Wilcox gave a talk tape once of, that tells you how. A talk tape. (laughs) Like those of the younger generation to know what that is. They're like, what's a tape? <laughs> Ouch. Oh my gosh. That's tragic. <laughs> he had a talk to him <laughs> about um, how shall I know about marriage and just a lot of the navigation of the marriage conversation, especially in our culture. And he t- compared it to the Lord and the Savior and the Father bringing Adam and Eve into the Garden of Eden and saying, we've created all of these things for you to partake of and enjoy. There's this one. Hold off. Not now. There's consequences. But everything else, go, 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 go. Satan comes in and is like, the tree, the tree, the tree, the tree, the tree, the tree. He only will focus them in on the thing that they can't have in the moment. And he compared it to marriage and saying, Hmm. that is not the only tree. That is not the only tree. And somehow Satan has told our culture that that is the only tree. I've applied that in countless spaces of my life of being able to say, okay, this isn't what I thought I wanted. So where are the rest of my trees? Because I know he's giving me countless trees 
And so those have been the moments when I've walked out of the boat, when I've tried new jobs, when I've tried new friendships, when I've tried new anything, I feel like is when I'm like, Hey, as a party of one, I don't really have a backup plan. (laughs) I don't have a backup when I walk into a new ward and try to make a new community. I don't have kids to rely on to be like, Oh, I've got to go hide behind my kiddos. And I got to get to primary. Like (laughs) it's me. There's no spouse to like be my wingman man to ask us for questions. Like it's all up to me. And, and so those have been some pretty, pretty be- beautiful moments. And then to fall when I misstep in relationships at work, when I misstep with relationships and family, it's still all on me. There's nobody else to blame. That's not my kids' fault. It's not my spouse's. It's not my in-laws. Like there's no one to hide behind anymore. It's just me. So how has your respect for God increased through some of those hard times and in some of the good times? What have you learned about him? That there's nobody else I want to kick it with. Like there's nobody else I want on my team because like we've said, he sees, he sees all that I'm not. And he sees just as the homeless man and whomever, like, He sees all that they are in the moment. Like their eternal glory is the vision with which God has seen all of us. The men on the street, the men in prison, the women in prison, like whatever it is, the, the men and women trapped in a political world, like whatever spot, like he sees all of us in our ultimate glory. It's not a, like, I have to become anything. I'm it. It's, I get to discover and uncover and pull the scales back from my eyes for me to see what he's already seen. And God, I like that. I like to be with somebody that already sees me as my very favorite self. And then sees you as your very favorite self. And I want to get to know that favorite self. Well, for me, I find in those moments where I can get those scales off of my eyes, And I can see truly how God feels about me, which is hard. It takes time. And sometimes I don't feel that. Yeah. But when I ask to understand how God feels about me and how he respects me, it's easier for me to see that in you and see that in others. But I have to see it in me first. Yes and no. I mean, I don't know. I might push you on that one. Push me. Because, I mean, going back to 1 John, I think the reason why I have been able to practice finding how God sees me is because I've had a lot of people that have found parts of me that I'm like, shut up, really? That's what you see when you see me? Like, that's really your version? Your definition of Emily Snyder is that? I like that version. How do I show up for that version more? And so, yes, I, I think there's more power when I own it and when I start seeing it for myself. But I think it truly comes from somebody first to seeing it and choosing to see that in me first and in us first to then be like, huh, maybe there's something to that. I want, I want to try that on. I want to be that more. But don't you think that's still God answering us in how he sees us? He uses other people. Sure. Totally. But I don't even know that I would have asked. I would have known how to ask the question. So yeah, Mm -hmm. but I don't. I think when I was 10 years old and Kathy Barber, like just kind of let me nestle under her wing for a lot of things. When I felt like such an ugly duckling, Kathy always cared. Always. I didn't know how to ask for the heavenly hugs or know how to recognize them at that point. So yes, for sure, God, but willing people that choose to be respecters. Well, isn't that interesting? If we can be those people who choose to be respecters, are we helping others see themselves as God does? Can can we be that for someone else? And maybe that is what the ask of, of respect and why that's such a key piece of peacemakers is that without that recognition that we're all in this together, we're all equal in his eyes. Like no matter what I do or don't do, it doesn't matter because I'm his child and he sees the long game. The more I see that, the more peace I feel about what I'm trying to accomplish in regular life and the interactions and me. I just keep coming back to the Savior 
because if we truly want to become like him and he is the Prince of Peace and he brings peace and we want to have his peace and bring his peace to others. Like that's what it means to be a peacemaker, right? We have to make his peace. He had authority and he had respect, but how did he show respect? Well, and I mean, and there could be an also an interesting wrestle for another day too. Of we choose to believe his authority and choose to see his behaviors as showing respect and having respect but most of the world at his time didn't because of his behaviors of interacting with those that society deemed irrespectable. I don't know. For me, I don't love pedestals. And so I try my darndest to, to negate pedestals and interact with people as humans and be like, cool, you did amazing things. And I respect the things that you've overcome and the hard things that have happened. So Emily, how has having respectful relationships led you to more peace, like respectful relationships with yourself, with God and with others. How has that brought you more peace? I think it's taught me to see the long game, that it's not about the short wins. It's not about winning the thing, but it's the long game. I mean, I've seen enough that it's an an internal game that it puts things into perspective for me. That doesn't mean I'm not impatient. Like, I will be the self-proclaimed, maybe most impatient human being that I know. So that's the practice. And how grateful I am that God is playing the long game. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's just easier for me to, if I can constantly remember that it's the long game, then it's easier for me to practice more respect with others, that God's working the long game in them as well. Yes. 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 And that some lessons I've learned, they have yet to. And lessons that I've yet to learn, they've mastered. And that like, this is my individual experience, my individual relationship, and it's the long game. And how important it is to recognize and realize that. Yeah. I think to respect also means to respect those, like when Jesus went to the women and the sinners and the marginalized, he respected and understood the long game. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if somebody has a different viewpoint than me or a different situation, it doesn't mean that there's not experiences that they've had that they can teach me. Right, 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 right. And figuring out the timeframes of what that conversation looks like is going to be, again, it may not be as I'm racing to a meeting. But when we can understand that, how much peace that can bring into my daily life and my actions and my mistakes. Yeah. When I don't measure up, I can still feel peace, understanding that God respects and is playing the long game. So good. Hey, Emily, you know, we like to end every conversation with a small and simple thing that we can work on through the week to bring more peace. So what do you think? What is a small and simple thing that we can work on this week to have more respectful relationships? (laughs) Um, My invitation would be to use the phrase either in our head or verbally when people are frustrating or in a moment where we maybe don't want to respect them. Like, oh, they're human too. Okay. Oh, you're a human too. All right. Cool. That's a great phrase because not only does it give us respect for others, but also for ourselves. I think it teaches us both. Such a joy to have you here. Such a delight and honor. Thanks for letting me come hang out. For me, a key phrase from this conversation that is going to stay with me is when Emily said, self-respect comes from understanding your relationship with God. Thanks for being here and hop on over to Instagram at Magnify Community for more inspiration and conversation. And of course, subscribe and listen to the Magnify podcast wherever you get your shows. Let's meet up again next week.